So welcome everybody. My name is Ayana Jones. I am the ID Mentorship 365 Program Manager for the IDSA Foundation. Uh, again, thank you all for joining us for um, crafting your, your you uh, mastering academic journal publishing. Um, this is a part of our um, first year of our mentorship uh, webinar series. Um, and special thanks to our speakers who I'll introduce here shortly. Yes, feel free to pop in, in the chat and introduce yourselves. Um, so before I turn over the program to our moderator, I have just a few housekeeping matters. Um, so again, this webinar is being recorded and will be available on demand if you um, can't stay for the entire program. Um, the presentation will be uploaded to the Cooper Lessons section and to our IDSA Foundation YouTube channel. Um, so you as the attendees will um, have your mics muted, uh, but feel free to use the Q&A feature to ask questions during the event. Um, there will be a actual dedicated Q&A session at the end of the presentations where you can come off camera and um, come off mute and um, and introduce yourself and just you know pose your question. Um, so if we can't get to all of the questions during, during the, the live event, we'll do our best to address them in the follow-up email, um, in a follow-up email. Um, and then finally, as you all know, we're on social media at IDSA Foundation across all platforms. Feel free to post or share your takeaways from the webinar, um, tagging us using the hashtag, um, hashtag ID M365. It is now my pleasure to introduce our host and moderator for today, Dr. John Lee. Dr. John Lee is an associate professor of medicine at Brigham and Women's Hospital in Harvard Medical School. He is the deputy ed editor for the Journal of Infectious Diseases and um, the prior associate editor, editor and deputy editor for, um, sorry, for um, open forum infectious diseases. Um, and we're so glad to have him. Yeah, he's a wealth of knowledge and expertise, and we're, we're glad to have him as a moderator. So I will pass it to Dr. Lee to give a little bit more information about himself and also to introduce our speakers. Dr. Thank you so much, Liana. This is, um, we're so excited to welcome all of you to this uh, seminar series. Um, in this first uh, webinar of our ID Mentorship 365 webinar series, we'll be exploring the intricacies of publishing research in academic journals. I am thrilled that we have um, two esteemed editors, one from Clinical Infectious Diseases and the other from the Journal of Infectious Diseases. Um, that's Dr. Cindy Sears from JID and Dr. David Pagis from CID. They will be offering their insights, strategies, and practical knowledge about publishing. Um, this will be an opportunity to learn how to hone your skills and elevate your um, success in academic journal publishing. And um, importantly, their presentations um, are relatively short so that we can have plenty of time to dig into your questions uh, at the end of their presentations. Um, please submit your questions during their presentations in the Q&A uh, box. Uh, and uh, at the end of their presentations, um, uh, if you would like to ask a live question, you'll have an opportunity to um, come off, uh, come onto video and, and unmute and to ask your questions directly uh, to them as well. So uh, without uh, further delay, it is my pleasure to uh, welcome our first speaker, Dr. Cindy Sears, the Editor-in-Chief of the Journal of Infectious Disease. Dr. Sears. Good afternoon, everyone. Thank you, John, uh, for uh, introducing me. Um, and I'm delighted to be here to tell you all a little bit about myself, as well as give you some insights to JID and its processes. Next slide. So first, I thought I would start by giving you a sense of my background. I'm a physician scientist um, for many years now. Uh, after graduating from Penn State and Jefferson, I went to the New York Hospital, which is Cornell's Hospital in New York, and that's where I just I fell in love with infectious diseases and gastroenterology are really uh, the gut. And one thing I always, since this is a, a series on mentorship as well as the journals, I wanted to tell you a little bit about my mentorship 
journey and how it influenced my career. Uh, after my residency, I had the opportunity to train for one year in epidemiology with Dr. Mary Charlson, indeed of the Charlson uh, Comorbidity Index. And then I had another year, an extra year of clinical infectious diseases at Sloan Kettering with Dr. Don Armstrong. And that was all because of the way fellowships were organized at that time. Then I went on to the University of Virginia for a formal three-year fellowship and uh, spent three years in the faculty there and have been at Johns Hopkins ever since where I've been an ID fellowship director and after working in various capacities uh, with IDSA for about 20 years, I had the privilege of being president in 2019 and then uh, was really fortunate again to have another privilege to be the editor of JID beginning last year. Next slide. So this slide illustrates my feelings about mentorship. Some of it is serendipity and it comes in different packages. I have some animation. Can you just hit, hit the, yeah. So mentorship takes many forms um, and a very pivotal uh, event in my life was when Henry Mazur, now chief of critical care at the NIH was my ID attending and Barry Hartman, now master clinician, at Cornell and Jean Pop, the leading physician scientist in Haiti, who also ultimately was awarded the highest uh, award in France for his service to the medical community. We were on service together and little did we know, but we saw the very first case of HIV infection uh, that occurred at uh, Cornell, which was included in Henry Mazur's classic article in 1981, one of the inaugural uh, articles um, on HIV infection. Later that year, I had an opportunity uh, to go work in a refugee camp on the eastern border of Thailand, where my commitment to ID and to GI medicine uh, was solidified. Um, and there's just some pictures there of that. When I came back from there, I ultimately landed at uh, Sloan Kettering with Dr. Armstrong as HIV hit New York City in a dramatic way. And so those events sculpted my vision of joining uh, academic medicine. Next slide. And this is simply to say that mentorship continues throughout your career. I'm, of course, indebted to Dick Grant at UVA, who took me on, even though I didn't know how to pipette. I am happy to say I found a woman mentor, not so common at that time, and Julie Sando. I was the only physician she ever let in her lab, and she is the only investigator I know with a perfect score on NIH grants. And my experience at Hopkins only reinforces my notions about mentorship. So let's turn to JID on the next slide. So the focus of JID uh, is translational science. And so what I wanna emphasize to you on this slide is what manuscripts are appropriate for JID. Uh, we're interested in bench to bedside, bedside to bench uh, science, anything that informs us about infectious diseases and their pathogenesis. And can you hit a few times, I probably shouldn't have put animation in here. Yeah, two more, I think. One more, there we go, okay. So we get a range of articles and this is just to tell you what we review. Uh, one area is we certainly review articles in epidemiology. Uh, our sweet spot, I would say, is clinical translational science or human-based laboratory science. And just a few tips if you send articles to us in this field, please explicitly explain your study design prospective case control, whatever it is. Uh, describe the criteria for enrollment, your inclusions, exclusions. Comment on why this is a new novel contribution. And if your sample size is small, which is sometimes appropriate, please justify why that had to be. Sometimes it's obvious, sometimes it's not. And make sure you include human and animal regulatory 
approval. And on the next slide, I'll tell you a little bit more of that, but don't go to the next slide yet. The other area that we uh, review are phase one and two clinical trials, as well as the laboratory aspects of phase three clinical trials. And we do basic experimental studies in the field of infectious diseases. What we don't do are case reports or case series, at least not very often, and only if they include substantive laboratory work that informs us on disease pathogenesis. Next slide. So for this talk, uh, since I think you're all uh, more younger investigators, the two manuscript types I wanted to emphasize for JID are major manuscripts, which can be up to 3,500 words, or brief reports, which can be up to 2,000 words. We have other formats. Some of them are more invited. They're somewhat specialized. But for primary research, these are the two types of manuscripts that we uh, offer. We do offer format free uh, manuscripts, but please include line numbers, page numbers, concise but informative cover letters. So the things we really want to see in the cover letters is what is new or novel about your study and why is your study important to your field of investigation. By format free, we don't want you spending a ton of time figuring out all the nuances of how a journal ultimately wants you to submit the manuscript. We want to try to make it easier on you, the, the submitter. Sometimes we receive manuscripts that are transferred after review at another journal. If you decide to send us something like that, please include the prior reviews in the editor's rejection letter. And that most often comes in as a pre-submission inquiry. In other words, to assess whether or not um, I view it as appropriate for submission to JID. If I do, then in addition to the reviews and prior editor's rejection letter, I would ask you to upload to the JID website a track change, revised manuscript, and a clean manuscript copy. This is to try to facilitate and speed up, if we can, uh, the review of your manuscript through our system so you uh, get your answer more quickly. Next slide. So who are we at JID and how do we do our work? Well, the first step when a manuscript arrives at JID, after it passes manuscript completeness checks, which sort of happens um, behind the scenes, there are, there are four of us who actually evaluate a manuscripts at the door. And roughly the percentages that we do this, one, of course, is John Lee, who uh, you just heard from, and then Opie Singh and Neil Clancy round out our group. Um, these manuscripts are triaged by uh, the office to each of us in those proportions, roughly and also per our areas of expertise. But it is true that I will take manuscripts across all areas of infectious disease. So bottom line from that means that I assess somewhere between typically 25 to 40 manuscripts a week. And that I only tell you that to emphasize why it's so important to point out in your cover letter what, what is important about your study. And I have an animation again. Clear here. Can you hit? There we go. And the second step is the unfortunate reject at the door, um, which can happen um, and actually happens for many manuscripts. About half of manuscripts are rejected at the door at JID. If we decide to review, then the, the your manuscript will be assigned to an associate editor who then assigns reviewers. Um, and we get a small number referred from CID or OFID for consideration. There I list our wonderful associate editors um, who are talented in so many areas. Next slide. So I have a few additional thoughts. When you prepare your manuscript, have it ringing in your head, clarity, clarity, clarity. Um, that is probably most important, both for us at, at JID, but also for the reviewers. Do consider your figures and tables 
carefully that they be clear and high quality. Always remember that color and pictures engage reviewers and readers. And we would like to encourage visual abstracts. We have not made this a requirement as yet, but that may come. This is a way to give your manuscript a quick view as to what you view as most important. And it's a great way to promote your work upon acceptance on social media. When you respond to reviews, uh, be non-defensive, use a neutral tone, no matter how irritated you may be. And we have all been irritated at comments uh, from reviewers. Do try to answer all the queries. And if you can explain why or why not a complete response may or may not be feasible or why the answer needs further study beyond the scope of the present study. A, a, a feature that happens uh, fairly frequently in review, reviewers pushing for more information. However, I want to be clear at JID, we only infrequently ask for additional experimental evidence in review. We try to avoid that. So if you don't understand something about the process, ask. My email address is readily available. You can appeal a rejection after review, but appealing door rejections uh, is rare. And actually, I haven't gotten one in the last year that I can remember. Do let us know if you are a new investigator. We are intent on promotion of new investigators, and that includes uh, individuals at all levels in training and our more junior physician scientists. Next slide. So the suite, I just wanna emphasize the suite of IDSA journals work as a team. You're gonna hear uh, from uh, David Pegues about CID. Uh, for OFID, the clinical science is more emphasized at this point than laboratory science, although that may uh, even out over time. Uh, more confirmatory studies uh, are sent to OFID. And I know that um, Roger Vadimo is particularly interested in public health, uh, hospital epidemiology, and infection control and global health. And I want to emphasize that we are all committed to the concepts of uh, diversity, uh, inclusion, and equity. So this little diagram illustrates what happens. Papers come in, to, I should have put these arrows there, but papers come into each journal. CID refers a fair number to JID because of the focus of JID. We refer occasional papers to CID, but not so many. Both CID and JID do refer uh, papers fairly liberally to OFID. And overall, uh, the journal's goal is to keep the best science of infectious diseases within our suite of journals. And then you can you click for me? Yeah. So uh, just to make you aware, and you're gonna hear this from David as well, uh, if you publish in JID as a first or last author, we are working towards adding you to our reviewer database. And in particular, uh, this, uh, we are interested in trying to recruit younger in investigators to our, uh, as our reviewers. And last slide, I think. So, and I couldn't resist putting in a slide of all the individuals um, that over time that have worked in the lab, uh, which uh, is part of the excitement of science in infectious diseases. Thank you very much. And with that, I'm gonna turn it back to John. Thank you so much, Cindy. That was fantastic. And uh, just a reminder to uh, please submit your questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we will go through the Q&A box at the end of both presentations. Uh, in addition, there will be an opportunity for you to unmute and ask a live question as well at the end of the, uh, the two presentations. So um, it is now my pleasure to welcome Dr. David Pagis, who is the deputy editor uh, at the uh, clinic, the journal Clinical Infectious Disease. Dr. Pagis. Thanks very much, Dr. Lee. And uh, Dr. Sears, um, very much enjoyed your presentation. So I guess it's incumbent upon me to share a little bit of my life story, at least professionally speaking. 
and particularly how I got interested in academic publishing. Um, my primary role uh, currently is as medical director of healthcare epidemiology, infection prevention and control, and associate director of the antimicrobial stewardship program here at the hospital of the University of Pennsylvania. And I've been here for the last 12 years following a 17 year stint at the David Geffen School of Medicine at UCLA. But even before that, I became interested in the interface between infectious diseases and public health practice as an undergraduate taking graduate level courses at the University of Chicago uh, during medical school. And then subsequently after my internal medicine residency as an EIS officer and preventive medicine resident at the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, including a one year stint in the state uh, Department of Health in, in uh, Alabama, of all places. Um, rather than heading off to a career as a public health officer, whether on a federal or a state level, I had made a, a conscious decision to return and continue my training in infectious diseases. And I was an infectious disease fellow at uh, the MGH program. And after our first clinical year, I spent three additional years uh, doing basic molecular pathogenesis of salmonella typhimurium, uh, at which point my then mentor, Sam Miller, took a full-time uh, equivalent uh, state job at the University of Washington. And at that point, I had met my soon-to-be wife and uh, decided that it was time to stop my training and actually go get a job. So I was privileged enough for the year period um, uh, prior to taking my job at UCLA uh, to work in the laboratory of Dr. David Hooper, who was a deputy editor of uh, the Journal of Infectious Diseases and someone who I've maintained contact with uh, in, for a long period of time. I also was a fellowship program director at UCLA for 12 years. And I want to stress to you, not just in the context of academic publishing, but how important mentorship is to building your career, whether you're a clinician, whether you're a basic scientist, whether you're someone involved actively in clinical research or in the public health sphere, these individuals who mentor you um, during and following your infectious disease training as a junior faculty member will be the people who you rely upon to write letters of uh, support for your academic promotion, but much more importantly, they'll be friends and colleagues um, until the day um, you all retire. So I got interested in academic publishing first from an administrative uh, perspective. Uh, I am a member of the Society of Healthcare Epidemiology of America, and in the early 2000s was first uh, the uh, associate chair and then the chair of the publications committee. And publications committee have oversight of the editorial activities, the submissions, the dollars and cents, uh, the um, impact factors of, of journals. Uh, and that was both illustrative to me of really giving me some insights into uh, the nuts and bolts um, of academic publishing, but it, importantly as well, how important it is to have a effective partner uh, as your um, uh, publisher. And I was involved in several decisions along the way for infection control and hospital epidemiology and choosing the publisher of the journals. Um, I then sort of morphed into a frequent reviewer for a number of journals in my specialty areas, obviously clinical infectious disease was one, uh, infection control and hospital epidemiology another, and every now and then for you know large general interest journals like the Annals and the New England Journal of Medicine. Ultimately, um, now seven years ago, I was asked to be an associate editor for clinical infectious diseases and for Three of those six years, um, we slogged through the COVID pandemic and a tremendous increase in our overall volume of uh, submissions. Um, more recently, uh, for the last two years, I've been a deputy editor and like a de our other three deputy editors and 16 associate editors uh, under the leadership of um, Dr. Sachs, we have specialty areas of interest. All of us handle um, certain types of manuscripts, particularly involving COVID related issues. But I'll speak in a slide coming up how important it is to target your um, cover letter uh, 
and the topic area of interest, which has been recently revised at CID, um, so that we can assign it to the right deputy editor and the right deputy editor and the deputy editor then, if it's going to be uh, considered for review, can send it to the right associate editor. So the next slide, please. Um, and I, uh, I've entitled this Top Tips for Publishing in CID, and I've stolen shamelessly from Dr. Lee, who was kind enough to provide a top 10 list for JID that he preferred. And Dr. Sears has emphasized, I think, the growing impact of social media, the visual abstracts and other ways that you can both attract traditional readers, whether they're reading the print version, whether they're reading online, whether they're picking and choosing from an electronic table of contents or accessing the content through uh, social media. Um, I did not share uh, a detailed breakdown of our editorial board, but it's large and uh, getting bigger uh, literally by the day. Next slide, please. So let's start on what is clinical infectious diseases focus. I think the title tells you. Uh, CID's focus is on practice changing reports that clinicians can use when caring for patients at the bedside. And that can involve primarily original research, but increasingly, and you know, to, to, to great acclaim and, uh, and, and uh, hits, uh, state-of-the-art reviews, which I think are particularly useful for comprehensively summarizing best practices uh, with um, critical evidence reviews. But in addition to these state-of-the-art reviews, we also publish society and multi-society guidelines around infectious diseases, infection prevention and control, and antimicrobial stewardship. And these are among the most highly and widely cited documents that are published in clinical infectious diseases. We also publish um, you know, human interest or um, professional interest pieces, the so-called voices of infectious disease, Many of those recently have focused on uh, individual practitioners experience with the clinical practice of infectious diseases during the COVID pandemic. The things that interest us the most in terms of content are the clinical presentations, the diagnosis, the treatment, particularly novel approaches to treatment, as well as the prevention of the full range of infectious diseases evaluations of current and novel treatments, primarily phase two and phase three clinical trials, diagnostic microbiology and immunology as it impacts clinical care, as well as public health and public policies as they relate to patient care. Next slide, please. And Dr. Sears has uh, already emphasized uh, why a pre-submission inquiry may be of, of value um, in getting some feedback in, in terms of the right match with your subject uh, and the journal's focus areas. But uh, a pre-submission inquiry, in addition, gives you a rapid gauge of the overall interest in the subject matter and the clinical impact as assessed typically by the editor-in-chief, but oftentimes the editor-in-chief will ask some of the deputy editors, what do you think of this? Uh, and it may be presented uh, via email very briefly as a, as a text summary, as an attached abstract, or the full report. And importantly, if CID decides that uh, we're going to encourage submission, the report will be reviewed one way or another. Uh, it will be sent out for a full review by one of the associate editors, or if once the full report is received, and we find that it's a poor fit or, or not an optimal fit for the journal, the associate editor is tasked with at minimum providing a mini review to, um, if you will, e explain the, the change of heart that, and a decision that we're not going to send it out for full review. Uh, but don't be discouraged uh, if CID or any journal uh, does not encourage uh, submission by one of these pre-admission uh, pre-submission inquiries. You save some time and effort. That time and effort isn't as substantial now as it would have been uh, in the pre-format free days. Uh, and importantly, on occasion, the editor, depending upon their willingness to do so, can suggest another journal that's a better fit overall for your for your uh, submission. Next slide. Thanks. Um, uh, 
Dr. Sears has emphasized that instructions to the authors are important. They're available on the website. Uh, and much as uh, JID and other journals are now, now going format free to decrease the administrative or the sort of the technical barrier for journal submission, do follow the specific requirements for the article type. And that includes the word count, the figure limits, and the reference count. Um, and a cover letter is important. Um, a few sentences or, or so can state, and you should state rather, how your submission could influence the clinical practice or shape public policy around infectious diseases uh, in the clinical or the public health sphere. And don't simply restate the results. I find a cover letter important too, particularly if I am reviewing as deputy editor to determine an initial recommendation for the article when I don't a priori know the significance of um, the findings. If that can be related very succinctly in a cover letter, that's very helpful in focusing uh, my initial reading and review of the article and initial decision. Um, and as I've emphasized before, we've gone to a much wider number of clinical subject section headers. That assists us in making sure the right associated editor is assigned if the article or the uh, submission is going to be reviewed. Next slide, please. Um, just a, a, a little bit of insight about editorial flow. Um, as Dr. Sears has emphasized, there may be an initial decision made by the editor-in-chief or a deputy editor to refuse review of a manuscript. Uh, and that may, um, and, the, and the goal is as soon as possible to provide that feedback to the author, so author or authors, so that they can make a dis decision about where best to send the manuscript. Um, if you don't hear back within a matter of two, three to five days, um, that is not evidence necessarily that your article is undergoing consideration for review, but uh, there may be some good things happening behind the background. Our decisions, as Dr. Sears has emphasized, is we can refuse a manuscript. We can refer it to a sister journal uh, in the IDSA family, but that also includes for clinical infectious diseases, the pediatric ID journal, JPIDs. Um, and uh, on occasion, particularly when it's an invited uh, review or a response to correspondence, we can accept uh, a manuscript uh, without uh, review. Increasingly, however, we also have that option for articles that have been fully reviewed and vetted by major medical journals that are then transferred to clinical infectious disease. We leave it up to the associate editor to make a decision about whether to send an article like that out for additional review or to accept it because we expect with the submission to CID that the authors will have responded to uh, in a detailed fashion all the comments of the other uh, reviewers from the other major medical journal. Uh, when we send something out for review, we try to offer timely service, but we're at the I wouldn't say the whim, we're at the, the, um, at the mercy of our uh, reviewers and understand that providing an a excellent review, which allows an author uh, to understand the strengths and weaknesses and improve upon the manuscript is not an easy task. And it's something that uh, definitely should be mentored and should be uh, uh, learned. We aim to provide uh, feedback in terms of a first decision and reviews within four weeks of time. But as I've emphasized, sometimes finding reviewers who are not overwhelmed, who are the appropriate subject matter experts and willing to review can be a challenge. And in addition, when we receive uh, feedback from two or th sometimes three reviewers, when there is um, substantial discrepancy in the interpretation of the significance of the results or the strengths or weaknesses of the manuscript, we may invite the, continue to invite the manuscript out for additional reviews before rendering uh, an ultimate first decision to you, the author. Next slide. And don't be discouraged uh, if your submission is refused or rejected. There are a variety of very valid reasons that that might be the case. It doesn't mean you haven't uh, conducted uh, and uh, written good science. Um, for the clinical infectious disease perspective, it may be that we're primarily focused on something that's going to change practice now rather than an excellent study that confirms existing dogma or existing practice. 
an article like that that's practice confirming that's well done is a perfect fit for uh, OFID. And again, that this idea we're trying to appeal to a, a broad swathe of uh, readers, um, both domestically and internationally, and, and the focus and the uh, generalizability of the findings when broader is obviously of greater interest to us than something that has narrower focus uh, or narrower generalizability in terms of its clinical impact. And if your article was reviewed but ultimately rejected, hopefully if the reviewers have done their job and the associate editor provides additional feedback, it's been an opportunity to identify issues with the study design, analysis, or interpretation that can be improved upon to allow you to submit and successfully have your manuscript um, accepted elsewhere. Um, we make recommendations um, to reject, um, hopefully with appropriate uh, reviewer feedback. But there's also the option that goes on behind the scenes if we feel like a manuscript is still of sufficient quality, as Dr. Sears has emphasized, at the point of the initial uh, decision following review, uh, we will offer internally uh, the manuscript to OFID and sometimes to JID if the editors of those journals decide that they're interested in the manuscript. There's a lower bar, if you will, uh, to acceptance, particularly with OFID because they have the benefit uh, and I might emphasize a more timely turnaround uh, to a decision uh, because they have the benefit of the reviewer's comments and can make their own independent editorial decision. But lower threshold overall, particularly to OFID for something that's a quality manuscript that maybe is practice confirming uh, rather than practice changing. Next slide. And um, I think Dr. Sears has uh, sort of hit this in spades. Uh, be polite and respectful in your response to reviewers' comments. Some reviewers are way off base but you want to respond to every comment and directly answer each point being raised. If the reviewer failed to understand something, understand that the fault lies at least in part with you. Um, so be respectful and when possible, do what the reviewers ask when it isn't, explain why it's not. And if your submission was reviewed and rejected, as I've emphasized before, revise your paper based on the reviewer's comments. Um, it doesn't do you a service and it doesn't uh, uh, do the whole editorial process of service if you simply take your manuscript that was rejected and send it off immediately to another journal for review. Next slide. Uh, can you appeal a decision to reject? Again, Dr. Sears has emphasized this. Um, uh, the answer is potentially yes, if a reviewer is fundamentally flawed. Uh, and oftentimes, what we do, and this doesn't happen frequently, uh, but we can make editorial decisions to invite the manuscript out for a additional review, if if you will, as a so-called tiebreaker, particularly when manuscripts uh, and the associate editors feel they may be sort of on the fence about an editorial decision. And remember the comments that you receive uh, as the submitting author from the reviewers are just part of the review decision. There are, um, uh, comments uh, made uh, just to the associate and the deputy editors, which uh, are not shared with you, that oftentimes weigh on our ultimate decision whether to reject uh, or whether to um, ref uh, re recommend uh, revision, whether it's a minor revision or a major revision. And finally, next slide, please. If you submit to any one of our family of journals or elsewhere, consider being a reviewer. You know, it, it's a it's a it's a privilege to be um, involved in the editorial process, but it's also a responsibility uh, for all of us if we expect our uh, colleagues to perform uh, reviews, which is a labor intensive uh, effort of love, if you will. I think it's important that you all consider being a reviewer. It'll give you some. Uh, insights uh, into how you as an author can best respond to um, the comments being offered by your reviews. So thank you very much. Uh, I'm hoping there's some questions and I'm gonna turn things back now to Dr. Lee. Fantastic, that was two wonderful presentations. Um, thank you so much, Dr. Sears and Dr. Pegues. Um, could you both please unmute and also turn on your video for the Q&A portion. Uh, as a reminder to the audience, 
please use the Q&A button to ask questions at any time. Um, and in addition, um, you know, if people want to also um, sh uh, show themselves on video and raise a virtual hand when you have a question, that would be great as well. We are taking, uh, taking live questions as well. So why don't we start off by a couple of questions that have already come in. The first question um, is from Dr. Mehrotra um, about whether reviewers um, can or, or could be are encouraged to submit papers to our journals. And I, I think also the larger question is what is the role of the reviewer in the publishing ecosystem? And uh, why should we not only be an author, but also be a reviewer and vice versa? So maybe I will, um, I since since Dr. Pegues, you ended your presentation with that, uh, with that, why don't you uh, take that question? Yeah, for um, for people who review for society journals, um, there are little icons within editorial manager uh, and ways that uh, we can uh, evaluate both the quality of your reviews and the volume of your reviews. And um, it, it may or may not have direct impact upon an editorial decision about an individual manuscript, but it, heck yes, it has a lot of impact when decisions are being made by editors in chief about who will be on the editorial board uh, and, uh, and things like that. So I would certainly encourage that there are some benefits of being a reviewer, a good reviewer, and a frequent reviewer in terms of engagement with the, with the journal. Um, when editors, excuse me, uh, when authors are on the editorial board, we give, uh, at least in clinical infectious diseases, priority and ensure just as we do when we have a, a pre-submission inquiry and recommend submission we give priority and at minimum we'll have that manuscript reviewed by the deputy editor and the associated editor to make sure that we're making the right initial decision. So yes, uh, review at a higher level. And uh, Cindy, I'd love to, I'd love to hear from you. It's, it's so critical uh, to the process of uh, academic, uh, particularly society publications that we have quality reviewers and, uh, Dr. Sears has emphasized the the goal of having you know junior investigators submit more to Journal of Infectious Diseases, and I think it's incumbent upon us as people involved in the editorial process to, whether it's within our own institution, whether it's our fellows, whether it's our junior faculty, to encourage them um, to uh, review. Uh, and certainly, I can't, in addition to my sort of daily grind of uh, manuscripts that I have to review for CID and the editorial or review work that I do for other journals. I can't review or respond to every request for review that I get. And that's an opportunity to engage one of the your colleagues, one of your junior faculty, one of your fellows uh, in the in the review process. And, and it's a good opportunity for mentoring as well. There is the option whenever you're invited to do a review of asking a um, someone to, uh, you I think, you know what I'm, I'm trying to say, you, you can have, you can have a fellow, for instance, you can have a junior faculty member co-author a review with you. So just a couple of comments, Dr. Sears, anything to add? I, I completely agree. And it's really, a, a, you have dual roles as we, we need people as reviewers who are experts in their area of, uh, work. And we need authors. And so I've frequently been an author and a reviewer for the same journal. Uh, for example, if I submitted a manuscript to JID from our work, I'd be stonewalled off by my colleagues and so it would all be handled. So there's no conflict of interest, right? So we are very uh, careful about um, being neutral in our approach to uh, evaluating man manuscripts. And John, do you want me to answer that question? Well, there's, well, yes. I mean, there's been some related questions to that, okay. which is how do you volunteer as a reviewer, but also any advice for our um, fellows and junior faculty about how to be involved on the journal's editorial boards 
And maybe I will have Dr. Sears start with, with that those related questions. Yeah, I think the first step is to review. And I would say in my own group, I make it a, a practice that every graduate student, postdoc, junior faculty who work with me, I involved in reviews that I'm asked to do. And uh, like David said, I can no longer do what I used to do, but um, I, I try to make sure I go through that process at least once, if not more than that, with each trainee or junior faculty member. So if you're in a group, I would ask your mentors to involve you in that and to give you that opportunity. In my case, I ask people to review the manuscript independently of me and to write something. And then we sit and discuss it. And then we finalize our thoughts and uh, I, I will submit. I always, and you should make sure this happens, I always make the editor aware that I've worked with someone else on the review. So they have their name and I know that that has had some impact over time where they then get asked to review. So first step is becoming a reviewer. Next step, at least at JID, is after you we, we take a look at all the scores of the reviews that David mentioned over the course of a year. And so we know our top reviewers. And after a few years, um, you there's a chance that you would become a part of our external advisory board. And you can always ask, right? I do get emails and CVs from people asking to be a reviewer. And, and that's perfectly reasonable. And I do my best to accommodate that if it feels like it's the right match. Oftentimes, of course, that, that's fantastic. And oftentimes, um, being asked to be a reviewer is a natural extension of publishing. Mm -hmm. And once you have published a, a paper or two, people think can find you on PubMed and know that you're an expert in a certain area, they will come to you. <laughs> you <laughs> won't have to be searching for papers to review. And uh, uh, Dr. Pegues, in terms of, again, um, how to get involved with the editorial boards. I know that um, IDSA now has a mentorship or, um, you know, kind of a trainee program for, for fellows. I don't yeah. know if you wanted to speak a little bit to that. I, I, I it, it was at least initially a pilot program that's now being further expanded, but I had the privilege of uh, co-mentoring um, with Paul Sachs, a, a junior faculty member for a, a six month um experience, if you will, uh, in the CID editorial process. And that involved both providing a number of reviews uh, for us uh, with structured feedback provided by Paul and myself, uh, attending our uh, annual meeting uh, and uh, every uh, two week editorial meetings that we have virtually, uh, as well as shepherding manuscripts sort of virtually. He wasn't part of the editorial manager uh, uh, software. He wasn't listed as an editor or deputy editor role, but I was able to engage him in, in the process from start to finish, reviewing a, a manuscript initially for an editorial decision, then sending it out for review, then assessing the reviews. So I think that's a, that's a great way. And the consequence of that is he was invited to himself join the editorial board after his six month stint. And uh, I don't think this applies to anyone who's listening today, but just as we look for uh, the quality and quantity of reviews, and that's the number of invited reviews and the number of accepted reviews performed, when you're repeatedly asked and you're on the editorial board and you're not fulfilling your obligations, whatever they may be, a minimum number of manuscript reviews a year, uh, whether it's sooner or later, uh, that's probably going to get back to you. So we, we, it, create, it creates openings within the editorial board when people necessarily want to or just sort of fade away from the, from the responsibilities. There is a question here, Dr. Lee, about acceptance rate. That's right. Do you want to start, uh, David, about the uh, sure? CID I, I, I can sort of speak. You know, it 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 varies. Um, uh, what I appreciate about the editorial process is that uh, I'm not the only one ultimately making a decision um, on a manuscript. As I say, when we have a pre-submission inquiry, 
Uh, there may be a conversation between the editor and the deputy editors. Uh, and certainly an associate editor may find something more or less exciting uh, than I do and is able to independently make a decision. But from the first review by the um, uh, by the editorial group, um, the CID uh, um, rejection rate, if you will, or the refusal rate is in, in excess of 50%. If your manuscript is reviewed, however, uh, it has a much higher probability of publication. A at the end of the day, the overall acceptance rate needs to be sort of stratified by the type of manuscript that's um, a type that's submitted, but is probably in the range of 15%. Dr. Sears? Yeah, I think we're pretty similar. The last time I saw our uh, overall acceptance rate, it was about 23%. So it's it's 50 to 60 percent, depending on the period of time that uh, may not make it to review. So there's obviously a high volume of manuscripts that are coming in. And then it's about 15 percent uh, after review. Obviously, you know, CID and JID are limited by the number of pages that can be published. That is not a limitation of OFID. And so OFID is able to take a lot of high quality papers, as um, you both have mentioned, um, that that um, unfortunately just, you know, kind of gets squeezed out from JID and CID. So there um, are a number of um, questions all surrounding a, a topic of, um, you know, uh, of, of kind of kind of young, early career investigator trying to write, you know, kind of their their first few manuscripts. You know, one, any um, suggestions on, you know, well, I guess one, how does being an editor, um, has that changed the way you write your manuscripts? Um, and also any suggestions on the types of papers that a a new uh, medical student or new trainee is, is trying to write up? Maybe they don't necessarily have all the data for a practice changing article, but uh, any, uh, any suggestions on, on that as well? Uh, maybe, uh, uh, Dr. Sears, do you want to start on this one? Sure, I can start. So for um, the medical student question, you do have to assess your content versus what the journal can do. Um, I will mention that OUP, which is Oxford University Press, which publishes uh, JID, CID, and OFID, um, is starting probably an infectious diseases case report journal um, because we, you know, we're ID docs. We love cases, <laughs> interesting cases. Um, and, and you may have noticed the annals, for example, of internal medicine has started a case report uh, journal, I think, or an appendum to AIM. Um, so that, so you have to match content to journals um, journal spectrum of articles. For the first, I don't know that my writing style has changed, but my best advice is um, get your figures together first and then sit and write your results looking at your figures and looking back because you can fill in the intro, you can write the abstract last and after you have that core results together, then you make a list of what your key points are for your discussion and what you have to investigate further to understand uh, your results. And the second piece is don't get tied up in details. Just do it. Just type it out and <laughs> start to finish. You may end up changing 80, 90% of it, but there is something infinitely easier about editing than there is about that first draft. And so people get stuck. Now, oh, maybe that sentence not right in this. But don't just keep typing until you get your thoughts uh, down on paper and then go back because you'll find it's much more fun once you get that first draft on paper. <laughs> That's my Great advice. advice. Great advice. I have to say another kind of article type um, that I found was um, was uh, I guess helpful um, to to write as a medical student or as a trainee was actually a meta analysis. 
And that was because, you know, it came from a question I had as a, as a you know, while in school and, and seeing patients. And also it doesn't require um, you to have collected any data um, yourself. All the data is already there in PubMed, but you have to make sure that you have a, a mentor who's going to guide you to the right question. Because when you're doing a meta-analysis, selecting the right question with enough papers and enough data, especially data that kind of goes both ways, yes and no. And, and so there's some confusion in the field. It, it does take a, um, a, a someone who has some knowledge of the, of the field. So um, there is a um, question about what to do when, um, you know, kind of an unfortunate circumstances happen. You've submitted to multiple journals and have been rejected. How do you deal with that? Um, how do you reassess the manuscript and where you're going and 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 um and you know when do you I guess also when do you you know say you get an immediate reject from a journal you know can you go and ask the journal for additional feedback right so Dr. Pegues did you want to ask that uh, answer that question well I've I've never had that problem <laughs> <laughs> of course uh, no no none of us have right? tip, typically what it, it in in some ways it's analogous to applying for college. You have your dream school, you have your reasonable likelihood, and then you have your, your safety schools. In terms of a journal, what is often the issue is not so much that you aim too high, but there's a mismatch between the quality or the applicability or generalizability of your data. And this may be especially true for case reports, and it's great there are opportunities out there now for really good case reports, whether they have, have an outstanding image or an important teaching point to, to find a place in the medical literature. But the idea, it, you know, CID is a society, is a specialty journal. And if you're being uh, uh, turned down by a society level journal, there are, is a hierarchy of subspecialty journals in your particular focus area that should be your next priority. And for instance, as someone who's very involved in healthcare epidemiology, there's a family of journals that are available. If you uh, submit something that, that deals with an epidemiologic topic or antimicrobial stewardship, that might be a great article for infection control and hospital epidemiology or the new Shea Journal or the American Journal of Infection Control. And you can also look at some of the overseas quality journals from Europe as, a, as an option uh, as well. And, and at the end of the day, you probably will find a home for your article or your publication as long as it's a represents a quality level uh, piece of research. It's it's just setting the expectations and aligning the expectations with really the, the scope and impact of the article that you've written. And to go back to Dr. Oh. Sears' comment, um, I can't stress enough how important it is to get something down on paper. And the way that it worked for me is oftentimes what do you do? You're, you're finishing a project and maybe you have an opportunity to present those findings internally in some um, departmental or divisional forum. You'd like to submit it then, you know, to a national meeting, whatever the national meeting is. Then if it's accepted, you have an opportunity to prepare your poster or your oral presentation. And the first thing you want to do, whether you uh, if you hadn't started to write the manuscript before you did your presentation, is then take that uh, and sit down and crank out your draft. And as a junior person, it's more likely that your aim is to be the first author. And by definition, that means there's a senior author. And by definition, being the senior author means you're the one who's responsible for providing structured feedback and helping that mentor improve their manuscript. So I think a lot of that process really goes on. It's not an expectation that you, you know, you'll know how to write, you'll know how to write well, uh, and you know how to sort of uh, optimally target your your journal. That's what your mentor's job is. Okay, among among many. And, and I think, yeah, and I think as mentors, we're also still learning. Yeah, <laughs> I don't know that we have this completely figured out yet either. So, well, we're we're out of time. So, um, if you have additional questions, I think there is an opportunity to kind of uh, to email the mentorship um, 
uh, the ID mentorship group, or also, yeah, I'm, I'm sure that Dr. C or Dr. Begies, and actually myself, we, we would always be happy to answer questions as well if you want to send us an email. Um, so now, a uh, thank you so much again to our two speakers, Dr. Begies and Dr. Sears, that for some really illuminating presentations about both publishing and also their own career trajectory and mentorship. So um, now I will pass it back to you, Ayana, to close it all out. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, uh, folks who have stayed on a little bit past the hour. Um, but thank you so much to our speakers, our wonderful guests, um, and our wonderful moderator. Um, so again, um, we IDSA Foundation extends our appreciation to you, Dr. Sears and Dr. Piggies, and Dr. J uh, Lee for moderating today's discussion. Um, thanks for um, your participation in the Q&A session. Um, and I also, also just want to quickly recognize um, Dr. Amari Pearson-Fields, um, the Director of Programs here at IDSA Foundation, who uh, was able to pop in very briefly. Um, so thank you, Dr. Amari Pearson-Fields, Pearson for joining us today. Um, if you wish to revisit the web webinar or share it with others, um, the recorded session will be made available to you via Cooper and our YouTube channel tomorrow. Um, you can subscribe to our IDSA Foundation YouTube page there. Um, and then we will also have the link to our next webinar um, in the, the chat. Uh, we'll be following up um, just to confirm. Um, there's a few things that are uh, we'll still need still need to confirm. So that one might be to be determined. So, um, but the link is there in the chat. We'll follow up uh, with those of you who have registered already. Um, if anything changes there, um, and then finally, uh, we post about our past and upcoming webinars on our social media channels. So feel free to connect with us there. Um, and again, if you have any additional questions um, regarding um, the presentation, any questions for our speakers, let us know. Um, you can email me directly. Um, the email address um, is on the next slide, I believe. Um, yep, yeah, there, there it is. Um, if you have any questions, email us there, um, and then I will funnel them to our speakers. So thank you all again, and have a wonderful rest of your day.